Joined now by TSN Hockey Insider, Darren Dreger, one half of the Rain Drags Hockey Podcast, normally on Wednesdays, but uh, some scheduling matters this week, so mm-hmm. here he is on a Friday. How uh, are we doing, Let's just take the opportunity again to thank Rick Dollywall for the... <laughs> How are you? How are yeah. you, Drake? And shocking, he would he, he would have that shtick that he has, and I love Rick. I, I I really do. But I wonder, as a younger man, how hard he worked at the impersonation of Don Cherry, <laughs> right? Because all the time I get Matt, Matt, just stop, Matt, Matt, okay, just stop for a minute here, Matt. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, he's, uh, he's well, as Grapes would say, he's a beauty. Um, he is a beauty. Yeah. Darren, uh, yeah, sure is. Uh, we've had a lot of trade activity uh, this yeah. week, and we're going to get to Columbus in a second, then, since they seem to be the focal point here. But Philadelphia has effectively announced intentions here. Uh, mm-hmm. When you make a trade like they made with uh, Provorov and taking on the money, <clears throat> It is clear that Philadelphia is looking to remake and refashion right. their team. Uh, what more is to come in Philadelphia, and might there be any connections here with the Vancouver Canucks? Well, as far as first trades go for NHL rookie general managers, that's a good one, right? A three-way deal with Columbus and the Los Angeles Kings and Danny Breer sends Provorov effectively to Columbus. So <clears throat> he cut his teeth in a big way. I, I think the Philadelphia Flyers... Uh, I'll throw Winnipeg into this equation because of the wild speculation that we're going to have around the Jets. But obviously, by design in Philly, they're open for business. You know, there was Carter Hart speculation for me. That's a little bit too complicated and complex for a myriad of reasons. So um, whether it's Carter Hart or it's Scotty Lawton or it's Konechny, a piece that Philadelphia doesn't really want to trade They've got to listen because end of the day, it's about a rebuild and it's about a better future for the Philadelphia Flyers. And, you know, we've talked a lot on this show uh, about the Vancouver Canucks need and want for a really solid number three center. Well, when I look at the Philadelphia Flyers and I see a guy like Scott Lawton, boy, my antenna goes right up there. Um, Now, what's the cost? I know from conversation I've had with Briere. He'd prefer not to trade Konechny. He'd prefer not to trade Scotty Lawton. So what can Vancouver or any team that has interest in those players, and there are lots of teams with interest in those players, get it to a point sweet enough where Danny Breer says, okay, yeah, I'm willing to make that move. But those are the conversations that are happening. Uh, I'm reminded by general managers this week that it is bizarre out there, the conversation, the buzz. And now we see... The trade activity and it's been a good week on the trade front but i think it's picking up as we get closer to the draft i'd have to believe the lawton would be available i mean Breer seems to have a vision based on that trade that we saw already and he's a 29 year old forward i mean he's cheap he's, he's reasonable yeah. price but you don't hold on to 29 year olds in a rebuild no no i think that's fair uh but you know you also have to be competitive in a market like philadelphia you can't just flat out roll over yeah. Yeah, uh, he's a competitive player. He's an excellent leader. He's good in the community, in, in a in a bunch of different ways. So there's higher value in Scott Lawton beyond what you can see as as an NHL player. Um, but that's what makes him attractive to other NHL clubs as well. In addition to his playing ability, so you know it's the game though, right, Blake? Uh, you know, teams say all the time, "Well, we'd prefer not to trade this player," until you get to a place where you're like, well, you know, the, the interest around this player is significant enough. Let's continue to push the peanut here a little bit, and, and maybe we get to that happy spot. And I feel like that's likely going to going to be the case, whether it's Vancouver or another team. Mm-hmm. It's just when I think of the 3C that the Vancouver Canucks covet, that's a guy that jumps off the page given the circumstance yeah. in Philadelphia. Yeah, that's almost the problem for him, though, is that he's a, he's, a, he's a good 3C and he's cheap. And in a flat cap world, there's going to be competition for a guy like 100%, that. Well, 100%. especially since he's coming off a career year, 18 goals, yeah. 43 points. So, like, he's yeah. had his best offensive season. Yeah. And he's been a stalwart there, a double digit goal, guys, uh, goal guy taking a ton of faceoffs uh, yeah. for the Flyers. A Kerfoot in Toronto is expected to hit free agency yeah. as well, right? Dregs, you think I that's think. a name that may interest the Canucks? 
it, uh, in well, that search for the third line center? I, I, you know, I haven't talked to management of the Vancouver Canucks about this, but you know, when you've got your whiteboard out and you've got that list, and we've all defined what the the primary want is and need is as a number three center, you know, you you make your list of of pending unrestricted free agents, and then you make your list of potential trade fits. And we looked at Scott Lawton as a trade fit. Well, as an unrestricted free agent. I would think that Alex Kerfoot would be high on their list. You know, at times he, he, he was frustrating. He was a frustrating player for the Maple Leafs, but maybe more from a fan perspective because you could see the skill set and you could see the want. And, you know, at times you could see the execution. It just, it seemed to be inconsistent. But he is a very versatile and serviceable forward. I mean, they played him in all situations in Toronto. Top line, second line, when they were healthy, he'd slide into that third line. He can play center. He can play the wing. So, again, I, I can't imagine, in fact, he's a BC boy, that you know the Vancouver Canucks wouldn't have him pretty high on their radar. The uh, search for top four defensemen here at one point became the never-ending story. <laughs> Yarmo Kekalainen in Columbus has got two he does. in the last week here. Uh, tell us about the happenings in Columbus because it seems they're tired of being bad. Yeah, dregs. and I think that there'll be some managers maybe a little PO'd out there because that often happens when they don't get the player or they weren't even involved in the transaction, the discussion, right? Um, let's start with Provorov landing in Columbus in that three-way deal with L.A. and Philadelphia. And instantly... And full disclosure, I did not talk to the Vegas Golden Knights or Kellen McCrimmon, um, but I said it on the podcast earlier today. McCrimmon collects Brandon Wheat Kings, especially former good Brandon Wheat Kings, right? Like, I mean, come on. So the fact that that Provorov slipped through his fingers, I think would, would more than annoy him. And I say that with a smile on my face because every once in a while I'll get a kick out of Kellen McCrimmon getting annoyed. Um, but, you know, he's got a lot going on right now. He's in the Stanley Cup final. I don't think anything can annoy me. Kelly McCrimmon is just like, Stanley yeah. Cup final drinks. Yeah. I think I he's got bigger I fish. Know. But I get it. But this, I tell you, this guy, you know, is just so wired to manage, right? And when you have the support of ownership like they do and George McPhee and everything else, you know, you want to be as aggressive as you can be. And even though you're consumed by what your team is doing in the Stanley Cup final, when you've got an opportunity to better your future and a piece like Provorov who I guarantee you McCrimmon has called on in the past um, pops not only onto the the trade bait um, you know list but ultimately gets moved or is close to being moved you'd want to be a part of that and then then Columbus lands Damon Severson who I think is a real good player and you know the the New Jersey Devils you know aren't necessarily in cap hell, but like so many other teams, they've got cap issues, right? So this is Tom Fitzgerald managing. I mean, Severson was set to become an unrestricted free agent. Why let him walk, you know? Allow the, the, the Columbus Blue Jackets to get to the agent, negotiate the terms of an extension, and in the meantime, you, you get a draft pick back as compensation for all of that. But more importantly, I mean, as soon as, you know, we reported that Mike Babcock would be the next head coach of the Columbus Blue Jackets. I, I said privately, okay, now watch Yarmo go here because he's not hiring Mike Babcock if they're just going to slow play it and, and maybe nibble at the playoff edges, maybe if they're lucky. No, and Babcock probably isn't picking Columbus, even though geographically it works for him. It's a smaller market. He's probably not picking the Blue Jackets unless he knows that there's a strong appetite to improve that roster. And man, did they improve their back end with two deals? With yeah. most other with most other coaches, I'd be thinking take the over every single night with the Blue Jackets, getting yeah. two puck moving defensemen like that, and heck, they might add a guy like a Leo Carlson in the draft yeah. to play alongside of Johnny Hockey and others. But Let's remember, we'll, Line A's there too. I'm yeah, like, wow, yeah. they can score some goals. Will Babcock allow those horses to run? Do you think, or is he going to be playing playoff hockey in October? No, uh, hmm. I think that I think they're a playoff worthy team. And I, I, I think I made some ridiculous bet with Jeff O'Neill and the Overdrive guys <laughs> over this. I, I is, don't. Is recall there any other kind? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I thought that they would be playoff worthy. You know, after the Provorov trade, and you got to keep in mind Zach Wierenski healthy 
is like a sure. blockbuster trade. Getting yep. him back is going to be significant. I'm always reminded of what ba- Mike Babcock would say. Oh, you know, he's a real good player, and we're surrounded by really good players. But, you know, there's the defensive zone, there's the middle of the ice, and then you get the fun zone. That's what I call it. It's the offensive zone. It's the fun zone. And you, know, you get that puck in the fun zone, you have fun. That's what you do with it. So, I mean, there's Babcock. Bravo, bravo, but, bravo. Oh, yeah, it's just steady, you know. <laughs> the, the fun zone uh, is the offensive zone. So, yeah, he's got rules. Most structured coaches do um but when you've got the horses that can run and now you've got the the two-way defense that can move the puck but are sound defensively to get the forwards the puck and then yeah you, you put it on the stick of lion a or johnny hockey and let them have fun in the fun zone and you generate offense so i i, I think it's a fit uh let me just ask before we move on Boy, uh, collecting defensemen and right shot defensemen now, too, because let's remember David Yerichek, the mm. sixth overall yeah. pick from last year, could well be a player for them this year. Mm. Andrew Peak, Adam Boquist, a one yeah. point a high pick himself. Yeah. Uh, is Columbus shopping a, a defenseman now with their surplus? Well, they could. I haven't heard that from Yarmo. And, and maybe he's just happy to have that internal compete. Right, you know, you you want a spot. You basically have your top four locked up now. It looks like in Columbus, and you've got some two decent pairings, I would say. So make them fight for that third pairing, right? And and look, you have to be adaptable as an NHL defenseman. You know, basically gone are the days where you're a left side or a right side. I, I, yeah, I mean, there is perfect balance, and I get it. And sometimes coaches will lean more so because they feel like one guy is, is more confident on his natural side. I, I understand all of that. But I think that the Blue Jackets are in a real good spot to maybe just pull it back a little bit. Now I say that, and with so much trade activity discussion happening, maybe there is something that gives them a little bit more punch up front than what they already have. I just know that the appetite in Columbus is as strong as ever to to get back into the conversation of being a cup contender. And that doesn't sound right as I say it because of the disappointment of this past year. But mm-hmm. at some point, no different than any other market in hockey, Yarmo Kekalainen has the trust and the loyalty of ownership and senior management of John Davidson. But all of that has an expiration date at some point, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. So they take it on the chin uh, another year. He can't fire any more coaches. He can't. He can't right. make any more big trades that fail to produce. So Yarmo Kekalainen is a true hockey man. He knows that he's on the clock, but de- he most definitely would be if, if none of this pans out. We forget, well, about the, we forget about the Goudreau trade, but you don't make that trade and then not try to be good. You don't, you don't make massive acquisitions of leading scores and then – and then just wallow in nothingness. No. So he's got to be making a big play. Well, and guys, let's remember his 2019 trade deadline where he just threw everything in, right? I mean, he, he went did. for it yeah. uh, unlike any GM I think we've seen right. go Loved for it, it uh, yeah. at, at a trade deadline. Uh, let's speak about a former Blue Jacket here. Pierre-Luc Dubois. Yeah. Is he going to get his trade to Montreal, Dregs? I mean, it's highly possible, but I, I think we, we need to appreciate that it's not Montreal or nothing. Um, I believe that Montreal would be a preferred destination, but I also um, am told that Pierre-Luc Dubois is willing to consider other areas, other clubs. Um, I, I haven't been told the identity of these clubs, and I think we can probably guess, right? They're always the same. It's Vegas. It's the Florida teams. It's Dallas. Like, I mean, it's the business side of things where these guys realize that, okay, I have the opportunity to win. Oh, and I could put a little bit more money in the bank by doing it, by playing, you know, in this city and in that state. Uh, I think the list is going to be short, though, in that 5-6 range at most. And I do see the Montreal Canadiens as a front runner, But... You know, the, the business at hand for Cheval Dayoff is not to make the Montreal Canadiens better or any club for that matter. And Winnipeg needs to stay competitive in in the equation of trading out this top end talent. So if you're Montreal or whatever team Dubois gets dealt with, which of your good young NHL roster players are you willing to part with? Because that that's going to have to be part of the equation to make it a fit from Winnipeg's standpoint. Keep in mind Pierre-Luc Dubois can say, I'm not signing in Winnipeg. 
He's a restricted free agent. What's he going to do? Sit out? I mean, they own his rights in Winnipeg yeah. for another year. Um, and that isn't the way Pat Brisson does his business. So I'm not suggesting that's likely. Uh, it's just Winnipeg understands that they they have a propriety position when it comes to Pierre-Luc Dubois, so the return is going to have to work. Hell about Shifley there as well, Dregs. Like, yeah. could could we see a real remaking here of the Winnipeg Jets with Kevin Shifley layoff? Yeah, we could. And, and you know, if I look at Connor Hellebuck, um, I call him a diminished asset. And the reason I, I word it that way is he becomes a diminished asset if he doesn't get moved this off season, or at least before the trade deadline. And we know how difficult it is to make a deal of that magnitude at or near the trade deadline. And I always feel strongly that you get your best return in the offseason because you have more teams to work with, right? And a more sense of flexibility with the cap and, and all of that, right? And their rosters aren't officially set. <laughs> so in Hellebuck's case, isn't it dangerous to let him go into a final year of his contract and then let him walk as an unrestricted free agent? And I'm pretty sure Connor Hellebuck has let it be known in Winnipeg, I'm not going to be the last man standing. You're trading Dubois. You want to trade Shifley. There's talk of maybe a buyout of Blake Wheeler. Connor Hellebuck is not sitting in the background and going, okay, let's retool, do whatever. So I think the best interest of the Jets is to move Hellebuck and Dubois and probably Shifley as well. And what about Alex Dabrinkit? Uh, what's the likely landing spot for him? He submitted his his ten team trade list now. Where, where does he want to go? Same same spots you just mentioned for Dubois. Yeah, but I'll throw yeah. one in more into the equation. That's that's his home state of of Detroit, Michigan. Mm. Um, and Detroit is intriguing to me because Alex Dabrinkit would be a real nice ad for Eiserman and and the Red Wings. You know, they feel like they need to turn that corner. Made some strides. But then Iserman, rightly so, moved out key pieces at the trade deadline, right? Uh, and the team responded positively, not negatively, but uh, they need some offensive help there. I, I guess I, I understand from a hockey perspective why it hasn't worked necessarily for Debrinket in Ottawa. I mean, it has. His, his, his production hasn't dipped off significantly. I think, and I'll give, I will give—I won't give my source credit, but somebody deeply involved in here who brings it back into the, the arena of the game. So Alex Dabrink is a left winger for the Ottawa Senators. Second line. He's never getting to the first line unless Brady Kachuk gets hurt. Brady Kachuk is, is always going to be the first option on the left side for the Ottawa Senators. Well, if you're a player who's got contract leverage and you believe and you've proven you're a top three player in the National Hockey League, are you okay with that? Are you okay with that? That's hard. And I, I, I can, I can, if that's truly why, and that, that makes sense to me because otherwise nothing else does make sense with how good that Ottawa Senators team is going to be. Hey, Dregs, we talked about it last week. The Stanley Cup Final has two skaters who – got their way out of their initial market and to a preferred destination in Matthew Kachuk and Jack Eichel. Mm. And I think we're going to see more and more of it, my friend, going forward. Fully agree. Uh, where players try and direct their yeah. careers in a far more aggressive and hands-on way than they have in the past. No question. Uh, marvelous stuff, my man. Thank you for all of this. We will catch up next Wednesday, and we'll send your regards to Dollywall. All right. Have a great weekend, guys.